good evening and a very warm welcome to the iconic Taj Mahal New Delhi and to Law Shaw, a magnificent venue at the Chambers. We at the Taj welcome you all for a much awaited rendezvous with Mr. Vikram Seth, powered by HSBC in association with a suitable agency and Speaking Tiger. May I now please invite Mr. Ravi Singh, co founder and publisher of Speaking Tiger, to take the evening forward. Thank you, uh, everyone, on behalf of uh, all of us at Speaking Tiger Books and a suitable agency. Uh, thanks very much for joining us for this very, very special evening when we release the 30th anniversary edition of a beloved classic. Billions in India and across the world have discovered A Suitable Boy since the novel was first published in the summer of 1993. And they have submitted happily and gratefully to its spell. Uh, as Satyajit was saying, uh, you know, almost everyone in this room, and I can vouch for that because when I came in, and you know, many people, there are many friends here, so we were talking, and almost everyone in this room has uh, uh, a suitable boy uh, story, where they were when they first read it, what they were doing. In fact, my colleague who uh, designed the cover, uh, she was very excited when we said, when I told her that you know we'd be doing this book, and she said, I used to read it, and that's quite, that's quite a feat, because she said I would be, in the, she was in Bombay, she would take the local uh, to work and all, she said I would carry it with me, I, I would read it in the local every day, and you know this is a, a big book, so so that's that's the kind of uh, you know commitment that people had to this great story and also uh, apart from the fact that everybody here has has a suitable voice story there are three people here dear friends ex colleagues who uh, were even more intimately connected with the making of the book uh, Renuka Chatterjee Uma Khan Reema Zaheer uh, and they would be at the press because at that time you had negatives I think Vikram Vikram will remember that and they would be at the press, uh, often also at night, checking the negatives, not only for typos, for whether there are any scratches, etc. So, so you know, so we all have these, uh, these stories about about a suitable boy. Uh, and I remember the fantastic reviews they greeted the first publication of the novel. Uh, they called it a triumph of storytelling, uh, a long, sweet pilgrimage to life, a book which covers India, and this is my favorite one, a book which covers India like a sun warming the whole country in its historical race. And they called it one of the great novels of the 20th century. Uh, it seemed to me even then that this last description would sound like an underestimation in some years, and indeed uh, that has proved to be the case. We are now into the third decade of the 21st century, and The Suitable Boy is still on almost every list of the world's uh, greatest contemporary novels, and it will be there 50 years from now. Um, it's an enormous privilege for all of us at Speaking Tiger that we've been given the opportunity to publish uh, this collector's edition of the classic and we're very, very grateful to you, Vikram, for trusting us with this. Uh, I can still recall the thrill of reading Vikram's incredible debut novel, uh, which was in verse, The Golden Gate, back in the late 1980s. And then a few years later, I found myself in publishing. When I first read it, I was in college. Uh, so I was in publishing, a, you know, a new editor, and then I was sitting before the great Kushwan Singh one evening, uh, discussing one of his manuscripts, which was nicely smudged and scented with pan masala. <laughs> and we were talking. Uh, he didn't know me. And here there was, you know, this nobody who was reading his manuscript. And I think he approved of me as his editor only because I told him in the course of the conversation that The Golden Gate was among my favorite books. And then he said, have you read A Suitable Boy? They should give him the Nobel Prize now, you know. So I said, yes, of course. And I had, of course, read it uh, and been stunned and soothed by its deep, you know, that's what I think is the greatest thing about this novel, at least for me, is the deeply human and gloriously capacious and generous storytelling. Uh, there's a brilliant review which recommends us, which is on one of the uh, volumes that we published on the back cover. It's a brilliant review which recommends a suitable boy uh, with, I think, the best lines that you can find to describe any book. Uh, it was in the Times, and it says, you should make time for this novel. It will keep you company for the rest of your life. You know, and this three-volume set uh, that we've done is designed specifically to help us to do that, to keep this massive and magnificent book, as many reviews have said, on our bookshelves for years, and to keep returning to it whenever we are in need of the pleasure and the solace and the delight that only a great story can give us. The first volume of every box set uh, that is available here for purchase this evening has been pre-signed 
by Vikram because it's a box set, you know, obviously it would have been difficult to sign, uh, physically sign copies here. So they've pre-signed and then we've shrink-wrapped them. Uh, they're available here and the title printed on the box and on the on the uh, covers of the three volumes. Uh, they are also, they're pr what's printed is in uh, Vikram's distinctive handwriting. So the editions we'll buy tonight are particularly valuable. Um, anyway, I've gone on for too long. I must not stand any longer between you and the main and I think the, actually the only purpose of this evening, which is to listen to one of our greatest writers. In conversation with Vikram is Shoma Chaudhary. Uh, there you are. One of India's finest journalists. She's the founder of Lucid Lines, an independent ideas and events company, and she hosts a highly regarded podcast called Inquiry. She has also been co-founder of that extraordinary news magazine, The Helka, and of Think, a conference of ideas where she interviewed some of the world's most celebrated achievers. Uh, I now request Vikram and Shoma to please come up on stage. Good evening, everybody. It's absolutely fantastic to be here. I'm utterly delighted to be speaking with the prodigious man who wrote a prodigious book. We all know everything about him, but I still want to say three lines about him. You know, reading up about what people have said over the years about the book and Vikram, I chance upon a beautiful, eloquent passage on him, which kind of sums up what I feel about him, that I think it's a stealth attack by the AI companies on us way before we knew him. Because in this post-human uh, phase that we are in, it was actually Vikram who was the first post-human. I think he was an AI uh, plant kept there. Because it's not every day that you meet somebody who can speak Chinese, write Urdu, think in Hindi, write in English, uh, write seven books of poetry, write a uh, libretto, write a book like The Suitable Boy, and then write The Golden Gate, which is a book in verse, while you're doing an economics PhD in Stanford. So now you'll understand why I feel that this is not a human being that I'm speaking to. So big round of applause. Begin. Where's your title? And Sam Altman is spending billions of dollars on the wrong thing. He really should be mining Vikram Seth's mind. You know? <laughs> and on that note, uh, I'm going to start with, you know, Vikram reading a small passage from the book before we really dive into it. This is a book variously that people have read as a, a pain to love, a pain to the family, and also a story about nation building. 30 years later, we are going to want to know about the stories behind the stories, and also about how Vikram himself looks back with a viewfinder on his own masterpiece. So there's a lot to unpack uh, from that lovely turquoise box. But before that, I'm going to ask Vikram to read for us a passage that he, you know, he once said, you must justify why you've pulped a tree. Every paragraph must justify why you've pulped a tree. So I'm going to ask him to read the passage that justifies why he pulped this many trees to write The Suitable Boy. Ladies and gentlemen, Vikram Saint. I thought I'd read the first sentence of the book and then not continue till the end, but just read a short passage uh, somewhere in the first half of the first volume. The first sentence is, You too will marry a boy I choose, said Mrs. Rupa Mehra firmly to her younger daughter. And that is a sentence that somehow is the genesis, the germ of the book. But the daughter has her own views on what she should do. Her mother has her own views on what she should do. And eventually there's a choice of three quite different... Uh, I just said. There's three quite different um, uh, bows or swains or... Um, Suitors. Suitors, thank you. Uh, that's exactly what I was looking for. Suitor boil. Um, for her hand. Now, the passage I'll read, and I'll only read one passage because I really don't think I want to be grilled rather than to read. Here we are. Mrs. Rupa Mehra came breathlessly through the door. 
she had been crying in the tonga. The tonga wala, concerned that such a decently dressed lady should be weeping so openly, had tried to keep up a monologue in order to pretend that he hadn't noticed. But she had now gone through not only an embroidered handkerchief, but a reserve handkerchief as well. Oh, my daughter, she said, oh, my daughter. Savita said, yes, ma. Savita is Lata's sister. Savita said, yes, ma. She was shocked to see her mother's tear-streaked face. Not you, said Mrs. Rupa Mera. Where is that shameless Lata? Savita sensed that their mother had discovered something, but what? And how much? She moved instinctively towards her to calm her down. Ma, sit down, calm down, have some tea, said Savita, guiding Mrs. Rupa Mehra, who seemed quite dis- distracted, to her favourite armchair. Tea, tea, more and more tea, said Mrs. Rupa Mehra, in resistant misery. Savita went and told Mantine to get some tea for the two of them. Where is she? What will become of us all? Who will marry her now? Ma, don't over-dramatize things, said Savita soothingly. It will blow over. Mrs. Ruba Mera sat up abruptly. So you knew? You knew, and you didn't tell me. I had to learn this from strangers. This new betrayal engendered a new bout of sobbing. Savita squeezed her mother's shoulders and offered her another handkerchief. After a few minutes of this, Savita said, Don't cry, Ma, don't cry. What did you hear? Oh, my poor Lata. Is he from a good family? I had a sense something was going on. Oh, God, what would her father have said if he had been alive? Oh, my daughter. Ma, his father teaches maths at the university. He's a decent boy and Lata is a sensible girl. Mateen brought the tea in, registered the scene with deferential interest, and went back towards the kitchen. Lata herself walked in a few minutes later. She had taken a book to the banyan grove, where she had sat down undisturbed for a while, lost in P.G. Woodhouse and her own enchanted thoughts. Two more days, one more day, and she would seek a beat again. She was unprepared for the scene before her and stopped in the doorway. Where have you been, young lady? demanded Mrs. Rupa Mera, her voice quivering with anger. For for a walk, faltered Lata. Walk? Walk? Mrs. Rupa Mera's voice rose to a crescendo. I'll give you a walk. Lata's mouth flew open and she looked at Savita. Savita shook both her hands and her right hand slightly as if to say it was not she who had given her away. Who is he? demanded Mrs. Rupa Mera. Come here, come here at once. Lata looked at Savita. Savita nodded. Just, just a, just a friend, said Lata, approaching her mother. Just a friend, a friend, and friends are for holding hands with. Is this what I brought you up for, all of you, and is this? Well, sit down, said Savita, for Mrs. Rupa Mera had half risen out of her chair. Who told you, said Lata, Hema's Taiji? Hema's Taiji? Hema's Taiji? Is she in this too? exclaimed Mrs. Rupa Mera with new indignation. She lets those girls run around all over the place with flowers in their hair in the evening. Who told me? The wretched girl asked me who told me. No one told me. It's the talk of the town. Everyone knows about it. Everyone thought you were a good girl with a good reputation. Now it is too late. Too late! She sobbed. Ma, you always say, Malti is such a nice girl, said Lata by way of self-defense. And she has friends like that. You know that. Everyone knows that. Be quiet. Don't answer me back. I'll give you two tight slaps. Roaming around shamelessly near the dhobi ghat and having a gala time. But Malti, 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 I'm talking about you, not about Malti. Studying medicine, cutting up frogs. Mrs. Rupa Mera's voice rose once more. Do you want to be like her? And lying to your mother, I'll never let you go for a walk again. You'll stay in this house. You'll stay in this house. Do you hear? Do you hear? Mrs. Rupa Merad stood up. Yes, Ma, said Lata, remembering with a twinge of shame that she had had to lie to her mother in order to meet Kabir. 
the enchantment was being torn apart. She felt alarmed and miserable. What's his name? Kabir, said Lata, growing pale. Kabir? Kabir what? Lata stood still and didn't answer. A tear rolled down her cheek. Mrs. Rupa Mehra was in no mood for sympathy. What were all these ridiculous tears? She caught hold of Lata's ear and twisted it. Lata gasped. He has a name, doesn't he? What is he? Kabir Lal? Kabir Mehra? Or what? Are you waiting for the tea to get cold or have you forgotten? Lata closed her eyes. Kabir Durrani, she said, and waited for the house to come tumbling down. <laughs> the three deadly syllables had their effect. Mrs. Ruba Mera clutched at her heart, opened her mouth in silent horror, looked unseeingly around the room and sat down. Savita rushed to her immediately. Her own heart was beating far too fast. One last faint possibility struck Mrs. Rupa Mera. Is he a Parsi? <laughs> she asked weakly, almost pleadingly. The thought was odious, but not so calamitously horrified. But a look at Savita's face told her the truth. A Muslim, said Mrs. Rupa Mehra. More to herself now than to anyone else. What did I do in my past life that I have brought this upon my beloved daughter? Bah! Savita was standing near her and held her hand. Mrs. Rupa Mehra's hand was inert as she stared in front of her. Suddenly she became aware of the gentle curve of Savita's stomach and fresh horrors came to her mind. <laughs> she stood up again. Never, 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 she said. By now, Lata, having conjured up the image of Kabir in her mind, had gained a little strength. She opened her eyes, her tears had stopped, and there was a defiant set to her mouth. Never, never, absolutely not. Dirty, violent, cruel, lecherous. Like Talat Khala? demanded Lata, like Uncle Shafi, like the Nawab Sahib of Bethel, like Feroz and Imtiaz. Do you want to marry him? cried Mrs. Rupa Mehra in a fury. Yes, said Lata, carried away and angrier by the second. He'll marry you and next year he'll say talak, talak, talak and you'll be out on the streets. You obstinate stupid girl. You should drown yourself in a handful of water for sheer shame. I will marry him, said Lata, unilaterally. I'll lock you up, like when you said you wanted to become a nun. Savita tried to intercede. You go to your room, said Mrs. Rupa Mehra. This isn't good for you. She pointed her finger and Savita, not used to being ordered around in her own house, meekly complied. I wish I had become a nun, said Lata. I remember Daddy used to tell us we should follow our own hearts. Still answering back, said Mrs. Rupa Mehra, infuriated by the mention of Daddy. I'll give you two tight slaps. She slapped her daughter hard, twice, and instantly burst into tears. <laughs> so, Vikram, I was going to start elsewhere, but because you read that passage, let me dive right in into Rupa Mehra, you know, who's almost the true protagonist of the book. Uh, you've given us this fiery, uh, you know, vignette of her. And uh, in, in other interviews, you've said that you really shaped her on your grandmother, to whom this book is dedicated. Yes. So was your grandmother like this, domineering, uh, bigoted, and lovable? And what did you really think of her? Of those three adjectives, I would choose the third. But she was a personality. I don't know. I mean, nothing like that happened in our family. As such, you no know, possibility. But Mrs. Rupa Mehra is very much my my nani, my amma, to whom I dedicated the to whom I dedicated the book to my father, 
and to my mother and to the memory of my nani. Now, I'd always hoped that when I wrote the next book, I'd be able to dedicate it to maybe one fewer, but sadly both my parents have died. So I'll, if I, when I dedicate a suitable girl, I'll dedicate it to the memory of all three. Yeah, yeah. but you know, you, you said lovable, that's too generic a word for a character this powerful that you dedicate. Absol Tell us something more about your grandmother and why she impacted you that much, in what ways? I've never met my Nana. He died 10 years before I was born. My grandmother, my da Nani, I would say, was a remarkable woman. She became, she was widowed in her early 30s. She had no uh, pension because in those days, Indians didn't get a pension. The British got a pension, but the Indians, my grandfather was in the railway service. He didn't get a pension. She didn't care about getting a house or keeping any of her positions. She pawned her jewelry. She did everything to give a good education. And that too, to some extent, with the help of friends, to her three sons and her daughter, whose son I am. She made no distinction between them. And um, in, I would say my, my grandmother was terribly sentimental. She'd always say, uh, Jab mein varu, jab chita pe, wo to tabhi mujhe, me, me yaad aayi to aayi. She was terribly dramatic, dramatic, sentimental and so on. But she had the values to make sure that all our four children got a good education, even though it meant that she had no uh, financial protection for herself. She would go from the house of one child to another, to the other in her old age. That was how she did. For me, she was almost the most formative influence in my life. So I'm going to come back to her because I had a few more questions, but uh, you know, we have so much to discuss. By the way, you say lovable and, and what was the other? I, was, I said domineering, bigoted no. and lovable. <laughs> I would say she was less bigoted than was Domineering, yes, as much as she couldn't be. Um, but what is so interesting is that when, you know, this is such an Indian book, I'm amazed, I was amazed when it first came out 30 years ago, that people from Greece and Germany and Wales and Cornwall said, and I knew it, said, this is our, this is particularly with regard to Mrs. Ruba Mera, this is my mother, or this is my <laughs> grandmother, or this is my mother-in-law, you know, and some people would say, such an intolerable personality. Someone would say, such a lovable personality. So, I, I mean, I'm not responsible for them. They're there now. <laughs> You're literally giving me cues as though we've orchestrated this, Vikram. But that was literally going to be my first We haven't met for 30 years. I know, we haven't met for 30 years, actually. Uh, I have an anecdote on that. You know, when I was recounting his CV, I forgot to say he's also a diplomat. Because 30 years ago when we met, there was a big diplomatic incident between Sir V.S. Naipaul, the American ambassador, and the entire literary circle of India and abroad. And the only person who could mollify a very, very upset V.S. Naipaul was Vikram Seth. Uh, the Indian ambassador was prostrating himself on the floor. Everybody was doing what they could. But it was only Vikram's little chits that could uh, bring Mr. Naipaul back to, uh, you know, back to the table and dine with everyone else. So that's another quality Vikram has. But to come back, uh, Vikram. I don't mean to interrupt. I think you give me too much credit. <laughs> but, okay, continue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, Vikram, you said, you know, these characters have a life of their own and uh, they've driven their own story in many ways. Yes. So that's the interesting question that I wanted to get from you, uh, answer to, was that, you know, this story is a book about family, about love, and right. about the nation. And Lata is a woman who has her own agency. And the thing begins with saying that you're going to marry the man I choose. As it turns out, the suitable boy turns out to be Harish, who is not somebody she necessarily falls in love with. She's in love with Kabir, who is a Muslim boy. But it gets to be Harish, who is the suitable boy in the book. So one, from the perspective of the book, why was it Harish that got chosen? And if you'd been left to yourself, not being driven by these characters, who would have you picked as the most suitable of the three suitors? Well, let me say there, there were three suitors. One was Amit, 
A poet like yourself. A poet, a novelist like myself. One was Kabir, dashing, very attractive, uh, cricketer. Um, and I think he was in the history department, Kabir. And then Arish, who was a, a shoemaker. Now, I can't explain quite why she chose whom. Characters choose whom they wish to. It's not as if I force them to choose someone or the other. In fact, I would disagree with their choice. That's what I thought. So, But, but uh, it has to be true to the circumstances of the book itself. Now, may I request you to take your question back? The reason is you've given the story away. To people who haven't gone through a fifteen hundred oh, page, okay. so I am it. I get, I get what Shoma said, <laughs> and also uh, be slightly annoyed with her for having. <laughs> okay, but here's the, here's this in my defense. No, I'm going to excess <laughs> calculation. <laughs> okay. You should never. I mean, like it's not a it's not a document. It's not a history, it's a novel. Okay. You don't want to know what's happening at the end unless you've gone through the bloody, like, <laughs> potha. Okay. okay, I'm just going to excuse myself, though he's not allowing me to. And this is now going to offend the whole audience, which is to say I looked at the demographic here. And then since we are celebrating 30 years of the book, I am sure there's nobody here that hasn't read the book. Is there anyone who hasn't read the book here? Please raise your hands. Yeah, I can see a few raise his hands. Ouch! <laughs> okay. Okay. That's two. That's two people. I got. We apologize. I take it. We apologize. Okay. 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 I remember one. Uh, uh, that's fine. Like if there were only two. Yeah. Take it. And uh, wow. <laughs> Chalo. No. Yeah. Okay. I, I so let's let's reason. only let's only address the first part of the question. That of the three suitors, who's your favorite and why? On my, uh, what day is it? Friday. Friday. <laughs> then today is probably a race. <laughs> Probably <laughs> tomorrow it'll be Kabir. Okay. And on Sunday or on Monday it'll be Amit. Uh, seriously, yeah. I, I have to be somewhat impartial about my characters. So I, it's within my brief to be annoyed at the things these characters do. But I can't force them into doing something that's not uh, consonant with their own character. Right. So, uh, Vikram, the, you know, this whole uh, construct of the family that is there in the suitable boy yeah. is exactly how families are, which is why, like you said, across cultures, people have responded so beautifully and positively to the book. Uh, but families in themselves are in many ways constraining constructs, you know. So uh, they, they force compliance and they force, there's affection, but there's compliance. And it's a huge trade-off and it's a trade-off that this scene captures, you know, between Lata and who she loves and who her mother wants. But the family in your life is also a very, very important, uh, you know, strand that comes back again and again in, in your books, in your interviews. Uh, you know, and yet again, you're deeply individualistic. You have declared yourself as, uh, you know, bisexual, as a homosexual, so very individual, uh, you know, um, individual sexuality, life. In that, can I ask you how the family has been such an important part? You know, why was it not a restricting part, but something that you almost have a panegyric for all the time? I mean, it's not a panegyric exactly. I realize the limitations of a family. I mean, there are good aspects, there are difficult aspects as well. I mean, in my case, I I could say that I I was lucky in my parents, but I could also say that I chose my parents well. <laughs> my father and my mother were both remarkable people. I mean, like, the watch that I wind every day, like, every, I shave with my father's brush. Um, my mother was the most remarkable person, but, you know, sometimes my father gets lost in that. My mother was a judge, and was all, my father was absolutely amazing. I didn't know him very well when I was young. I didn't even like him particularly when I was young, but I got to appreciate him more and more as the years passed. He lost both his parents by the time he was two. How can someone like that be a father? He could be a provider. But then, a wonderful man. And also he encouraged my mother, who was quite, I wouldn't say timorous, but I would say, unself-confident. 
despite her huge talents. Um, and it was he who gave her confidence and delighted in her successes, which is unusual for an Indian man of that generation to do. So I would, I would say that about my parents. As for uh, the question of sexuality, obviously it's hard for people of that generation to, to you know, people are brought up with a religious digest view of things. On the other hand, uh, you know, I have who I am and uh, I didn't... One thing my parents taught me, I mean, three things. Hard work, honesty and courage. And, I mean, that, those were their values. Apart from not just tolerance, but acceptance of people as they are. So, uh, I mean, if it took some minimal amount of courage to be relaxed about that aspect of my life, I owe it to my parents, actually, even though it shocked them. So, you know, before we move away to, as I said, discussing about the nation and other big strands of uh, bigotry and all of that, that, and where the nation stands today, I just wanted to pursue this strand a little bit more. Again, it's so interesting you picked this particular moment of confrontation. I found it fascinating that, you know, coming from, a, again, from outside a very liberal family, Justice said, like you said, the first woman judge in India, uh, you know, and coming from a particular class, I, I found it fascinating that you said that the way you came out with your mother was, and she's written of it as well, was when you were 30 years old and you were traveling with her in China, and she said she didn't want you to sleep with your then girlfriend, uh, Gabrielle. And you said, oh, you don't want me to sleep with my girlfriend, but you'd be all right if I was sleeping with a man, you know, and that it came out in that way. So again, I just wanted that insight that in this tension between individuality and family, uh, between choosing what is the comfort of your family and choosing what really makes you so individually, were these conflicts in your life that you uh, well, how did she react that day? My mother is, wasn't all that liberal. She was, you know, someone born of that generation. I mean, she's a judge, you know, the high court and this, that and the other. And yet, she was crying because her daughter hadn't got married at the age of 25. There's her daughter. She was <laughs> sitting and sobbing. So, I mean, like, people are complex, you know. They have different... I don't, I don't, I like... Sorry, what was the question? Like, <laughs> I was asking about this uh, tension between following individual, uh, you know, individual logic of one's heart and also then complying with what the family wants of you and the tension yeah. there. And how did you deal with yeah. that with your mother? I would simply say that the general lesson they taught me of, as I said, you know, honesty, hard work and courage were the things that gave me some... Um, a kind of buttress against the criticism that came. Because the general principles, so to speak, were more than strong enough against some particular uh, view that someone might have about, you know, whether men can sleep with men or women can sleep with women. I mean, that seemed trivial compared to the general question of how one should live one's life. And actually, I owe it to them. And in some way, I owe a lot to them. Even when I was arguing with them, I owed the arguments to them. That's a beautiful way of putting it. You know, that's, I think, probably the absolute fabric of being a liberal. That's, you know? is, and that's life. I mean, I wouldn't say just Indian life. It's family life. That is, you tussle, you love, but and you are, you are what you are as a result of them. You're right. So let me take you to some of the other brilliant characters uh, in this book. You know, there's the Kapoors, there's the Mehras, there's the Nawab of uh, Baitar, you know, who's, who loses his lands and uh, to the Zamindar, uh, abol Zamindari ab Abolition Act. And there's politics, there's, you know, so there's so much that's going on there. Uh, you, you've spoken about the family and this tussle between a very individual woman seeking her destiny and the destiny that her mother is uh, forcing upon her. And at the same time, the nation has also just been born and it's seeking its own destiny. You know? right. And the suitable boy could then also be who the nation is looking for to lead it. Ah. You know? And there's a huge amount of argument over whether Nehru was that suitable boy or was he not. You mm -hmm. know? 
So uh, when you look back now, 30 years later, at a time when there's so much argument over Nehru and his suitableness, uh, what do you feel? You know, when you were writing the book, did you have a kind of innocent uh, optimism about India? Do you still feel the same? Do you look back on Nehru and reassess his suitability? Uh, how would you think about that? Well, when I wrote the book, remember, I wrote the book 30 years ago. And the period I was writing about was 40 years before that. So it's like 70 years from now. It was just when India was 1950, 1951. Now, as far as Nehru is concerned, the two aspects where I, I think, I mean, Nehru, for all his flaws, was a generous person who believed in democracy. He could easily become a dictator. He was so popular. He could easily have become a dictator, but he didn't. He was a federalist or unionist. His letters to the chief ministers would span a decade where every fortnight he wrote to the chief minister. It wasn't as if he tried to dictate things. He tried to explain. He was a parliamentarian. He was also, what is so important, he prevented us from hating each other. Now, the problem is that in a country like India, which is a rich civilization, uh, even post the, 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 uh, the, the, the partition, um, Nehru prevented us from the systemic clutch of religious hatred. Whatever he did with regard to China, and there I have divisions with him with regard to Patel and so on. So Patel wanted to get rid of Kashmir, actually. He didn't want Kashmir. All this is a complicated business. But the main thing that Nehru did is for 20, 20 years, from 1947 to 1964, well, 17 years, and Shasti also, I would say. And then Indira Gandhi kept us from the uh, from one Indian being taught to hate another Indian on the basis of whom they love, who what food they eat, what they drink, what God they pray to. I consider this illogical. I consider this unpatriotic because you're dividing the strength of your nation. And I consider it un-Indian because we're a rich country. I even consider it Vasudeva Kutumbakam, etc., etc. Udara Charitarama to Vasudeva Kutumbakam. People of a general un-Hindu. So that's my view of things. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful that you uh, ended by saying I'm Hindu, you know, because that's, um, that's, Again, in the way one interprets Hindu, that's exactly what it means to be Hindu, is to be su supremely plural, you know. The but very word Hindu comes from the river Indus, Sindhu. It's the people who live here. I mean, if you really go back, then all the Hindus came from Central Asia. It is the Adivasi, the Adi, the original livers in this country. To suddenly take it upon yourself to say, oh, the... Bang the door. Come in, bang the door. Oh, the Christians came late. Oh, the Muslims came. Madness. Why should we reduce the richness of our culture, the strength of our culture, by the meanness of making our fellow citizens feel less at home in what is their home? So, you know, a lot of this is already bubbling in the novel uh, back then, like you said, 70 years ago. All these seeds are there, the strands are there. And yes, 70 years later, and I'm going to come to that about how you think about India and if you're writing The Suitable Girl now. But all these strands are there in your book. You know, there's the mosque, there's a temple being, uh, the, the mosque being built next to the temple. There's a tense moment there. There are riots, there are Ram Navami and, uh, you know, processions that are disrupted. All of that is still there. Uh, I wanted to ask you, Vikram, I'm coming back to that idea of love. You know, that different characters in the book uh, fall in love inappropriately. But you, you know, when the 377 article came up, you wrote an absolutely beautiful lyrical piece in defense of love. Uh, I don't know how many of you read that, but Vikram wrote that the only redeeming thing all of us 
rotating on this completely insignificant planet that's rotating around an insignificant star in this giant universe, the only redeeming thing is love, you know? So someone who feels that deeply about love, the characters in the book all fall in love inappropriately. <laughs> and now you're forbidding me from discussing the book, but... <laughs> no, I, I forget forbidding you from discussing specific the, the, no more, <laughs> the ending, yes. the result, the, 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 the plot. The plot. I, don't, don't, I mean, you can say anything you like, but don't say who she marries. <laughs> In but fact, she doesn't marry. She doesn't marry. <laughs> she remains unmarried. Yes. But but love in its in its pure individualistic sense doesn't triumph, you know? So in those ways, um I don't agree with you. I think okay. love is a strange word. It can mean passionate love, it can mean sexual love, it can mean love for parent for a child, it can mean all kinds of things. I am uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't fully subscribe to what you say. But I do agree that I want to sometimes just shake Lata and say... Not just Lata, other characters. Other characters also. And, and so I... I come yeah, Kabir. And I'm not just Kabir, a man who is wonderful in regard, you know, Ishan and Tabu. I mean, those, you asked me a little earlier, did you ask me about Oyen? Um, that... Falling in love as the son of uh, the Minister of Revenue with a Muslim the wife. However cultured, however steeped in uh, in Ghazals and Ghalib and Mir and was again beyond the pale. So yeah, I suppose there was, there was a lot of, uh, what do they call it, um, transgressive, that's the word, is it? Transgressive love. Which doesn't triumph. Which does what? I said it doesn't triumph and... Uh, Again, you're giving lot <laughs> not, not giving to... Lot to okay, I'm going to stop. I'm just moving away to themes. I'm not discussing yeah, the book. Exactly. Uh, I mean, the so, book is only an excuse. Forget about the book. Yeah, forget about the book. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, oh, Vikram, you know, it's fascinating that you announced that you would be writing A Suitable Girl, uh, which is a really ambitious thing to say, you know, after you've written... The, the magnum opus yeah. that survives 10, 30 years later, people are still so excited about the book. It's still on. So uh, when you were trying to work out for yourself who the suitable girl is, what happens to these characters, uh, you know, in the many years and decades that intervene, it's very interesting. You said you almost started to write a novella. Uh, you know, he was trying to understand his own characters and he said he started to think through a novella for every decade, you know, of... Uh, what happened to India in each of the decades after the 50s. And in that way, I, I, I don't know if you've actually written those novellas and they're waiting to come out, but at least in your mind, you thought through every decade. In that, now when you look back, do you understand these characters? What do you think would have happened to these characters? Who would Lata be today in your mind's eye? You know, has she survived? Has that marriage thrived? Who is she as a person? Has she become more compliant? Give us a sense of how you think your characters would be if they were alive today, given everything that's happened in the country since. That's that. What's your that, writing? That, that's what the books are. Yeah. Um, I I did think that between the age of twenty and the age of eighty, it would be good to see Lata the age of thirty, forty, fifty, sixty, and seventy. In short, uh, and Harish also her husband. Oh, well, <laughs> I did. <laughs> okay, but everybody here, everybody here, and yes. and I, I yes. hate to <laughs> tell you, Vikram, Vikram, it's impossible. Nobody today, so, within three minutes yeah. of movies that have cost billions of dollars, yeah. within three minutes, everyone two, knows two, the plot. Two hands were raised, and uh, <laughs> to that extent, um, my, this is a good moment to talk about something which I wanted to talk about, which is that. I am very, I'm quite reluctant to come into the public eye and, and talk about things, especially when I'm writing a book like A Suitable Girl. But Om, my dear friend, persuaded me. We're members of something called the BAS, the Vodka Appreciation Society, <laughs> which meets on Sunday. There's only three members, all, of, all three of whom are present here today. <laughs> And uh, I think he, one is this sort of one is the founder, 
and one is the treasurer, and I'm the peon and clerk. <laughs> and occasionally, honorary members are allowed in. But I, I thought so, you were going to see you're the taster. I am. I mean, <laughs> even when I'm not there, for some reason I can't come, we do a FaceTime clicking. He said, I would like, you know, 30 years have passed, I'd like to do something. And he's a publisher in his own right. And I said, I'd like to talk first to David Davida. But David Davida was the person who, when I first wrote the book, read the very first draft of it, came to Shimla, where my mother was a, was the chief justice, came and looked it over, gave me fantastic advice, a dear friend, and actually, I owe a huge amount to him. And at the moment, the book is sort of within the hands of the company that he is with. Not necessarily legally, but uh, I've allowed them to continue publishing it. And I felt it only right that I should ask him whether Oon could bring out this rather beautiful, magnificent version full of gold and turquoise. So there are Firozi, very luckily, with a box which I could live in that box. <laughs> and uh, and then Methali, who designed it, and my sister Radna, who helped in the design, and not just helped, but partly formulated the design. Ravi, who, whom you've heard. Yes. Um, I, I owe a lot to you know, the people who brought Shut it up. Right. Yeah. Most, and also, now as you say, oh, you know, you don't, you, you don't have to squash the head of your unborn child. <laughs> okay. You can read it okay. lightly. So, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to move away. I will not ask questions about suitable girl and I will not discuss a suitable boy. <laughs> so See, I don't want to constrain you. Yes, the yes. plot thing and I myself. Yes, uh, absolutely. So, you know, I was, I was asking you that you've written these uh, novellas through the decades. I, uh, I'm writing them. I mean, like, the novellas are like stepping stones in a ford to take me from the 1950s to the present. The 1950s is a suitable boy. The present is a suitable girl. These are fact books. The others, the 60s, around the time of the Indo-Pak War, Shastri's time, the 70s, which was the emergency, the 80s, the time of the assassination, of the assassination and the, the 90s, which is a very long period of liberal, liberalization and God knows how many prime ministers. Well, quite a, just one for the first half, but many after that. And then the the the, the denouement, which is the tens, the zeros, the noughts, the oughts, the twenty first century. Yeah, just that decade. So, so those are shorter books. Those are shorter books. I keep ricocheting between them. I write a chapter of this, then I go back to that. I have to adjust. Jugar. <laughs> right. Okay. So I'm I'm not going to. Since you're in the process of that, I'm not going to ask you how these characters have evolved in your head. I want to come back to you, uh, Vikram, which is that, you know, you're a wonderful hybrid. As I said in the beginning, you know, you're able to write in Urdu. You're able to write of music as though it's a painting and we can literally see the notes. Uh, Chinese, all of this. But you said that you went to learn Chinese because you read uh, Wang Wei and uh, Du Fu in, in translation. And it impacted you so deeply that you actually took off to China and, and started to learn Chinese. What about those poetry uh, poets and what about the Chinese culture impacted you so deeply? You know, what, what did it do and how did well, it speak to you? In the first instance, it wasn't Du Fu so much, it was Wang Wei. What happened with Wang Wei's poetry is that um, I was at university in England and um, I, I read some of Wang's, Wang Wei. Wang Wei is a fantastic poet. He's a nature poet, but not a nature poet in the way Wordsworth is. Wang Wei was a poet of the 8th century, as were Du Fu and, and Levi. I had read his poems and I was entranced, not only because of his, his way of dealing with nature, but also of his way of dealing with friendship, not his romantic love. The Chinese have a great tradition of friendship poetry because vast empire, people are shifted from one part. You may not ever meet your friend again for 20 years. 
So there was, there was this communication among the literati. It was a bit of a, a revelation to me. So that's why I thought, if I'm so moved by these poems in an English translation, then if I learn the language, how much more will it reveal to me? So in, in your uh, temperament, in your uh, cultural, aesthetic sensibility, what do you think has played the largest, or, you know, I mean, if you were to describe the, the cocktail of Vikram Seth, uh, then, you know, what part did Urdu play? What has Hindi played? Chinese, American, UK, you know, there are all these uh, very seminal influences floating around in the makeup of you. So, uh, <laughs> I'm now defining. <laughs> right. Now, and since you're not fact, like describing yes. the characters, describe like, yourself. The Going Gay, the first novel I wrote, was based on a Russian model, Pushkin's Eugene Onyegin. A suitable boy doesn't owe itself so much to, you know, Middle March and, uh, and Jane uh, Austen and uh, Jane Austen and uh, Tolstoy. Tolstoy as much as to uh, the story of the stone. The story is, of the? The stone. It's also called The Dream of the Red Chamber, the Chinese, great Chinese classic. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Uh, Shruti. It's in, uh, published in five volumes of Penguin. Read it. <laughs> Before you interview me next. <laughs> so, <But then, laughs> it's, so, I mean, there, I feel that why should I constrain myself why should I say, because I'm born in a certain geography, I must restrict myself to that? Why should I say, because the Brits ruled us, we should hate the Brits? Why should I say, because China, you know, attacked us in 1962, I shouldn't try to understand that? Why should I, I, I completely stupid, you're just, you're, you're, you're limiting yourself. And if you are, as I think I am, a, a happy Indian, why should I expect my nation to restrict itself in this way? It's a limitation. The great stanza, the second stanza of uh, Tagore's great poem, the first stanza of which is Jan Ganman. The second stanza, do you know the second stanza? Of Jan... Of yes, that, yes. Of the five stanzas, the second one is Ahorova Tova Ahavana Pracharita Sunita wo udaravani, Hindu wo sikha, Jaina parasika, Muslimana kristani. Pura paposhche maashe, Tova shinghashana paashe. Trema haar hai gata. Ye prem ka jo maala hai, wo pero diya gaya hai. Jana gana, ek ke bedhaayat. The, that which makes us, uh, the, the person who leads us to unity, ek ke bedhaayat ka jaya hai, haar bhaag, jaya jaya jaya, etc. If only, I mean, we should actually say, Aharabhatava ahavana pricharita shunitava udaravani hindu bodha shikha jena para shikha mushalavana krishtani purava paschava ashe tava shinghasana pasha preva hara gata. If only that had been our national anthem. Janakana ekka vidhayaka joya he. Bharata Bhago Bidhata Joy That's what one wants to cheer on. That is our nation. That is what we must be. That is what we will be. This is my everything. I'm going to very quickly open this up to the audience. I just wanted you to share a couple of things with us, Vikram, that when you were writing this book, again to get the textural and granularity of it correct, you went on many pilgrimages. You went and stayed with the Jatavs in Agra. You went and stayed with a, a Urdu tutor on the border of uh, UP and Nepal, if, I, if I'm correct. And you basically immersed yourself in many places to get the, the research right. Yeah. So tell me about, you know, you went to the Kumbh Mela. So tell us a little bit about these anecdotes. And when you stayed with the Jatavs in Agra, for instance, that's an unusual thing to do. What did it teach you? What, what, tell us about that experience. My general feeling about about all my books. They're not magic realism, they're realism, which is a bit old-fashioned, but that's what it is. So my old feeling has always been that if the people who I'm writing about don't believe it, then no matter what plaudits the book gains elsewhere, it's failed of its artistic endeavor. 
So if I were writing the Golden Gate, no matter what anyone else says, if people in San Francisco don't think it's true to that place, or when I'm writing an equal music, if a violinist thinks, gosh, he's played on the wrong string, it doesn't ring true. Or if someone who lived in the 50s in India thinks this book doesn't ring true. So that's why I feel I should, I must understand, I must immerse myself in that period, in that time, in the lives of those people. Because, in a sense, well, for example, in, the, in, in, in equal music, it's not just the violinist, it's also people, someone who happens to be deaf. If I just float on the surface and put my own thoughts about what it means to be deaf, or what it means to be a jatal, or what it means to be a violinist, or, I mean, or what it means to be cuddled the dog, for that matter to cuddle the dog won't complain. Um, then I think the... You know, what am I here for? Yeah. No, I was asking you about that experience itself. Do you re recall those... Uh, I do. T tell us a little of the color of that. You mean, of my living in a... In a, in a, in a no, of going to the Kumbh Mela. Of, do, is there anything anecdotal that was particular? I mean, I it was just textural. Yeah, avoid that question. So, Vikram, I'm, how long is this going to go? Yeah, I'm just going. I'm. I'm going to close this up. I'm going to open this up to the audience. Sure. Just one last question, Vikram, which is that in India as we are today, yeah. If you were writing the suitable boy today, yes. Uh, do you think that there would have been a different motivating force than su uh, finding the marriage for the girl? Do Do you see some really large theme that's grabbing you? Well, let me. Let me put it this way, the theme of the girl marrying the boy and whom she chooses is tied up with the elections, the first independent elections in independent India, with land reforms, with Hindu-Muslim problems, with caste problems. So it's not as if these other things don't enter in. Of course. The question is, what is the thread? What keeps the reader reading? What keeps me interested? It can encompass everything. So, I leave, I leave the answer. At that. Yes. Okay. Let's open it to the floor. Uh, let's open it up to the floor. Yeah. I'm Ritu, Ritu Menon. Hi. Uh, did you ever think of going back to what I think is your most brilliant book, which is From Heaven Lake? Did you ever think of going back to writing travel? From Heaven Lake is the book that I wrote when I was in my late 20s. And it's a book set in China, Tibet. And I, I lived in China for two years uh, as an economics student in the villages uh, there. It's about the only book, Ritu, that I can still other than the Golden Gate, that I can still bear to read. <laughs> because it's like a young man's adventure story, hitchhiking across Tibet and across the Himalayas to get to India. You know, like, it's not courageous, it's stupid. But... Did you ever think of back to that part? I, I would like to, but I mean, it, it requires some kind of impulse to go back to that kind of writing. I did write, I did get the notes for a book on Australia called No Ice. I, I travelled all across Australia, Tasmania, uh, Cooper PD, um, uh, the West Coast. These, but then I got on a train in December. It was terribly hot because that's what it is in Australia. It is very hot. And, and every time I, I asked the person on the train, um, do you think, they kept saying, could I get a glass of, they said no ice, no ice, or no ice might. It was actually no worries. <laughs> but, so that's, Vikram, I'm, I'm getting a lot of uh, signals from there, so I'm going to use that no worries as a great moment to end this evening on that and is. open it up. A big applause for Vikram. Sure. And, and a big toast. To the arrival of a suitable girl. Let me, let me thank my host. Should I do it for you, Vikram? Would you do it for me? <laughs> Let's do it for you. We'll do it Vikram, would, Vikram would like to thank all of you.
uh, uh, HSBC speaking Tiger Taj Mahal and a suitable agency. The suitable agency is particularly dear to my heart oh. because it it is it was founded by uh, Himali. Yes, and uh, I guess the non-white suited Arant <laughs> doesn't deserve a mention, but. Thank you all of you also, apart from all the checkerboard, thank you for coming. <laughs>